Hey Addicts, welcome back to another comic review. This time we're continuing our coverage on the IDW's run of TMNT with the IDW Collection V6. And oh man, does this look cool with Shredder on the front there. You also have Shredder on the back, which is really cool. Now, um, this has a lot going for it. Um, first off, let me just go over what is entailed into this volume. So you first off have the Muta Animals. Uh, it's still out on how you say that, but that's what I'm going with. The Muta Animals miniseries, uh, issues 1 to 4. You also have the ongoing issues of 45 to 50, uh, as well as the 2015 free comic book day. Uh, and to finish it all up is the Casey and April miniseries, issues 1 to 4. Um, now, we'll start with the Muta to animals. Uh, I'll just make this quick because, you know, don't want to make the video too long and also don't want to give away too many big things uh, because I think there is a lot of mix-ups in this volume that's going to shake maybe the next couple of volumes to uh, come after it. Um, so, with that being said, with the Muta Animals, uh, this is just focusing on Hob and his group of mutants that he's acquired or, you know, recruited into his army. And we get to see kind of a side, uh, I guess, objective of Hob uh, going after this group that is making more mutants uh, and kind of has their own goal of what they're wanting to do with them. Uh, and they're not related to the foot. I think, um, if I recall right, they do have funding from the foot or at least a... Uh, a shell front of it, but um, they are working on their own, um, which is going to be the, uh, what is it called? It's called the Null Corp Multidimensional Firm or whatever. So it's it's a multidimensional business, so maybe potentials of seeing uh, interactions with Dimension X, um, but this is all led by, or I guess, um, I guess owned by this, I, I don't know what she's really supposed to be. Maybe an alien, uh, maybe a mutant herself. I'm going to lean more towards alien from Dimension X, but uh, her name being Madame Null, uh, which has her own bit of powers that she gets what she wants. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of uh, Hob and his gang focusing their targets on this after responding to um, Lindsay, their scientist that they got from Stock Gym being kidnapped by this corporation uh, wanting her assistance on the mutants that they're creating at their place. Um, and, you know, there's a few other snowballing effect things that happen that kind of lead to the, into this. Um, you do get introduced to several new mutants, uh, creating Mutant Gym Man, or aka Seymour Guts, as he <laughs> is um, renamed. Uh, we also get a couple of other ones. Uh, Sally, which I think is supposed to be like a cheetah or a leopard or something like that and then you also get uh ray which i think he's supposed to be a stingray just judging by the name but uh, don't quote me on that because i honestly can't tell from the way they draw him but i'm pretty sure he's supposed to be a stingray um but yeah so this is kind of like i don't know i would describe it as it's a look at another mutant group that is unlike the turtles you know mostly doing the right thing, you know, setting out like being the ultimate good guys. On this front, it's more like gray area, I would say. And that's only really because of Hob being their leader. I would say a lot of the um, other members, especially like Slash, I think there is this kind of mix of, you know, them having good intentions and wanting to not hurt anybody in the process if they don't have to because their primary goal is to save mutants. But because of Hobbs' stance and his past um, story that we've seen in like his micro series one shot and just the previous ongoing issues um, kind of leads to have a more harsher stance on how they go about things. Um, and I do love that there is several interactions where it kind of goes back and forth. Um, you do see uh, Slash take on some elements that we've seen Leatherhead have in and some other adaptations where him kind of having this, uh, I guess, like a psychosis break or, you know, kind of a, a rage um, episode. And, you know, that is explained from that serum that he got because of uh, that, like, heightened his intelligence. But, um, yeah, so you do have moments of that and, you know, Slash, you know, having those intentions of wanting to do good, but ultimately maybe ha because of those episodes that he's having uh, in acting sort of maybe more of like high, uh, Hobbes ideals where, you know, he kind of loses control of himself and then, you know, having that, I guess, um, conflicting, uh, conflictedness to himself of, you know, seeing himself as a monster, even though he's trying to be better than that. And I think, um, there's uh, several great moments between Hobb and Slash and, you know, maybe even some moments where we get to see 
kind of more complexity to Hobbs character which I really did dig I think out of Everything I can say about this miniseries, I'd say um, the character development we get with the mutants surrounding this group is probably the, the biggest um, uh, outcome to it. Not only that, but I do think seeing the Knoll Corporation is kind of intriguing for whatever role they might play later on in the Uncoming series. Um, but uh, there is also uh, in this... Um, I guess it's not very important, but I feel like I would just highlight it because it's so rarely done in a good way. Um, but there is this kind of like subplot, not really subplot, but this sub element to uh, the story that does impact it in uh, a somewhat meaningful way. But um, that is with Lindsay and I can't remember who the other chick is, but there is another chick that used to work at Stockton with her and they actually used to be in a relationship as well as co-workers. And um, you get to see a little bit of insight and drama between either their past relationship and then, you know, how they view each other and then how that's conflicting with what's going on as they're trying to recruit her into this. Um, but I just liked it because it, it didn't feel like pandering at all. Um, and I like that the drama, even though it didn't seem entirely necessary at some points, it was done very well and it wasn't, uh, it didn't feel like it was taking away from any of the other elements. And I think by the time you get done with the miniseries, it actually has a very satisfying conclusion on it, on not only how that little thing ends, but also how it connects to the, the, the story that's told in the miniseries. So um, with that all being said, I think those are probably the, the main draws, I would say, for the miniseries. Uh, this, because it is kind of a standalone thing, it if you were just kind of collecting these individually and you didn't collect it as like, you know, this whole volume, this would be one that, again, this could be considered a throwaway. Uh, but again, because of the, I think, the deepening um, development you see of the characters attached to this main group and how that might affect their interaction with the turtles or how their, I guess, group might uh evolve or disband over time i think that's worth it in itself so i'm really glad that it was uh, included in this and um i wouldn't say that i i would like to see more muta animals uh entries because at the end of the day i still like the turtles more and i still want to see the ongoing series more but i think this was a perfect little side piece to have as just kind of like a companion piece so i, I really say for what it was setting out to do props to it and i think it did um bring something to the table for those characters that necessarily we didn't see in the ongoing series or maybe just capitalizing on what the groundwork was laid for that ongoing series um now uh we can go on to the ongoing issues so i'm going to break this down a little bit we'll go over issues 45 and 46 uh before uh, going on to the rest of them just because they're three the free comic book day issue is right after issue 46 but um Starting off uh, after the mutagens, this is kind of like the the very first peak we get to see of the turtles after the events of the last volume. So um, obviously with what happened to Donnie, he's not in a very good position and we get to see uh, just how they're going to tackle that uh, loss or that scenario. Thankfully, Donnie's not completely dead. Uh, he's just barely alive and Fugitoid is able to show up in between Fugitoid and his high tech from Burnout Island and um, you know also with the help of um, Harold and Splinter helping on the astral plane side of things at least that's how I'll label it as um, a spirit side however you want to call it um, they're able to stabilize Donatello and I think this is cool because um, you know also Donatello's been one of those characters that has always been against um, you know, the magical elements or even the reincarnation thing for this story in particular. And it makes sense because of him being that very logical, science-rooted character. Um, and I do think seeing him in this kind of in-between state or in-between plane of life and death and having him interact with his mother, uh, that was a very cool uh, thing for his character to go over. And I'm curious to see how that will impact him on his views of some other things that are brought up in the story going forward. Um, but uh, you also do have uh, the foot uh, getting a sneak peek here of the aftermath that they're dealing with because they think Shredder is dead. Um, and obviously Karai is assuming control there and wanting to blame all the 
um, all of the trouble on the turtles, right? So there is kind of a, um, a preparedness for going on the war path uh, and, you know, assuming duties. And I do kind of think it's uh, interesting that Karai takes the stance of um, throughout the volume and maybe even shown a little bit in this issue, but uh, just how uh, she really sees outside help, like, you know, um, for instance, you see it a little bit of like Stockman, right? She doesn't think that people outside of the foot should be considered allies or that they are the cause of, uh, I guess, um, bleeding kind of like the purity of the foot blood, if I may use that <laughs> metaphor there to uh, get across my point. Now, um, also in this issue, you get uh, Casey going out in the neighborhood, helping some people. This is the first time we've really seen Casey back in action, I think, since what? Like, um, either he was stabbed by Shredder or maybe when they were trying to rescue Leo. Or, yeah, I guess it was uh, when he went to go rescue Leo at the theater, right? So um, that was really cool seeing Casey getting back into uh, doing what he does best, right? And then we also get this kind of uh, tension moment of Hun uh, making his way towards the second time around, which is, uh, uh, you know, when you're reading it for the first time, you're like, oh, you're really looking forward to that action again. But um, there's also a really nice um, moments with the turtles, and I love just how they reflect on them, and it's not just, you know, blown over so quickly. I think uh, you definitely see the initial... Uh, I guess, reactions of how all the turtles are processing what happened to Donnie, and you get to see it throughout uh, the issues um, going through this volume. It's not just in this one instance, which I really appreciate, but this catalyst for uh, issue 45, having Raph kind of, you know, outburst, you know, because he is the hot-headed type and, you know, being very... Um, I guess just beaten up about not being able to do more, even knowing that, uh, you know, they had to deal with that um, bigger threat uh, with the Technodrome. And then, you know, Mikey just being the straight shooter that he is and, you know, pointing out um, kind of the, I guess, absurdity of some of the things that Raph says. But, uh, you know, because Leo is the calm and collected type, still hearing the importance of some of Raph's points through the anger, you know, even not necessarily agreeing with everything, saying, you know, uh, or I guess acknowledging the fact that Raph is right about certain things. And so um, I do like the complexity of that and just how each of them have um, their own way of dealing it that I think is in tune with their character. But um, also uh, you do have um, Shredder uh, hearing out Stockman, which sets up some cool things for this volume. Um, you do have uh, kind of like the master plan, I guess you could say, of Stockman revealed, or at least uh, seemingly a portion of it, uh, which leads to some pretty cool action going forward. Um, I won't go into much of the stuff uh, of the ongoing issues here, because I think at this point, um, I give you kind of the setup, and I don't want to go too deep, because again, this is kind of, I don't want to say a cla uh catastrophic change, uh, but it is like one that I think will be really, it's not shocking because I think they set it up really good and you can kind of see the clues if you're paying attention or you remember or you're, you know, you're reading them back to back. Uh, I think you're going to be able to piece it together. But the fact that they actually went through with it and uh, what that means for the next volumes, I just, I, I don't even want to potentially spoil anything for anybody that hasn't read this yet. So I'll keep my mouth shut there, but just know that there is um, some uh, great back and forth between uh, the characters in the midst of dealing with Donnie, even seeing like Angel and Alopex and, you know, how uh, they are interacting not only on like, you know, Casey and the April side of things or, um, on like the turtle side of things, uh, just love how their presence is, you know, cause there's attached to all these characters uh, at the same level, right? So I do love how they're included and they're also, you get to see, you know, different sides of them it, with, depending on like which situation they're in. Um, speaking of, we do have a big moment for Casey, uh, like I mentioned before, kind of setting up that uh, other conflict with his dad. And that kind of also, Splinters off to seeing April uh, doing her own thing, trying to find more info about uh, some of the scrolls and some of the um, 
I guess, history that the, the foot used to have and um, contacting Miller again, which there is a, uh, don't, things don't end up too great for Miller, but um, that kind of splinters off to, uh, because of what happens to Casey in this volume and what April's able to find out and take to the Turtles, uh, kind of leads into what ends this volume, which is the Casey and April uh, miniseries. So um, really do dig that. But uh, as far as the uh, free comic book day issue, um, it is mostly recap, so it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a necessary for uh, reading to get everything in between these uh, issues, even though chronologically it's it's in between 46 and 47. Um, but I do think there is some really good action that honestly, because of the action, I would say it's, it's worth it. Um, but... Uh, because not only do you get to see uh, what is, I'm always going to butcher their names, but like Kyoto and Bludgeon, I think, uh, you know, the other foot uh, mutants that Shredder has between his seconds, uh, and then also seeing Donnie back in the fight, but not maybe the way you expect it, uh, initially at least. Um, and then this kind of leads to, like I said, uh, you getting to see not only the foot, at the very climax, uh, having a very personal showdown, kind of traditional type match between the Turtles and Shredder, uh, or like Shredder and his A-team, but also getting to see kind of the first hints of what the potential threat of Stockman can be. So I, I really did dig that throughout the whole issue. But um, like I said, uh, we'll just go ahead and get into the Casey and Micro series um, miniseries, I guess. I said that wrong, but anyway. Um, so this is one that... I got a little bit more problems with, to be honest with you. So, like, right off the bat, there is this kind of vibe Casey has that they just give him this attitude where he's, like, um, they give him, like, unnecessary conflict with April just to show that Casey is out of sorts. And I've always hated that because there's so many times that, you know, you could do this in a less frustrating way, and I get it that sometimes, you know, not every character is going to process certain things certain ways, so I guess this is kind of the author's, um, I guess, uh, intention that they think Casey would process it this way, which, I, you know, honestly, with that being said, I don't, uh, I can see the reasoning behind it, but also I would counter-argue it where it's like, we never saw him act like this when... He's had problems with his dad before. He never lashed out to the turtles. He never did. I mean, he recognized who was his true family and was able to not push them away, but, you know, bring them in on his problems, right? Or at least not to not let it uh, bother him to like it was lashing out to his uh, his friends, right? So I, I see kind of like where they're coming from, but also just because how we've seen Casey process it before, it's like... Mm, would that really be how he acted? But um, there's also kind of like this, um, you know, quest that Casey and April are going on that, you know, I think they would expect a certain level of uh, threat or, you know, um, danger into their uh, their whole trip because they're having to go outside of New York and, you know, they're going into an area that technically the foot knows about or has potential to know about, but they're not sure, right? So I feel like they'd be on their toes and there's a couple instances where they let their guard down or they seemingly don't uh, question certain things until it's kind of too late or, uh, you know, it's like the trap is set. And it just seems weird that they wouldn't be a little bit more heightened to some situations that would stick out like that. But, um... This is kind of reintroducing the Rat King uh, and the, I don't know what we're calling them, the Immortals, I guess? I, I don't know what the, the lore-based um, uh, term is for these beings yet, unless I'm forgetting about it because it has been a little bit. But um, yeah, so you do kind of have this psychological mind game or toying that uh, these beings are doing to Casey and April, but they're able to get a few uh, answers to some of the, I guess, they're not answers really, they're more like teases to what potentially these beings might have uh, impact later or if they're going to be antagonistic or not. But um, along with that, we do see kind of um, uh, similar things to what Leo and Splinter dealt with with the Rat King having it be like a, a world in between worlds or like a pocket dimension uh, as well as um, 
new uh, introductions to new beings or and like you know so much like how we got introduced to the other brother in um the ghostbusters uh like crossover series we also have with um another sister introduced that is takes more of a native american um inspiration i guess you could say but yeah i think overall uh it's uh a cool insight to those beings uh but obviously not all of the beings have the same stance. And so you get a little bit of a peek of what this new one is and then also the Rat Kings. And so I'm just, uh, it's more of like a tease, I think, than anything. But um, with that being said, that's basically all that I want to talk about for this volume, uh, keeping it spoiler, as spoiler free as I can, like I said. Um, but um, this was very entertaining. I think this maybe had some of the most action we've seen in a volume, uh, at least in a while. I think like the last one maybe was uh, a little bit less than this, um, but, and that's saying a lot because, you know, we had the assault on the Technodrome and whatnot, but I, I think maybe because it centers around more of the foot and kind of the the New York villains that I, I kind of liked it a little bit more. Um, so I would say this is a gotta have it, uh, which I think is actually a point higher than last last ones, I think, maybe. So um, that's a, a good sign. Uh, I was glad that there wasn't any crossover series to it and also that, um, you know, the mini series that we do get in this are focusing on, again, characters that are based out of New York anyway. So um, yeah, I really digged it. And I think the cliffhanger for the ongoing series in this has never let me more hyped for the next volume because uh, it, it's something that I have never seen in TMT and uh, I'm sure a lot of people that are reading this series will really uh, find that um, just like a wild direction to go into and I can't wait to see what they do with it. But um, with that being said, guys, that's the end of this video. Um, we will, I don't know, the last Ronin Issue 2 review might be up before this. It might be coming up after. If it is, you'll see it in the links here. Uh, if not, then stay tuned for it because I will be doing that um, as soon as I can. Uh, I have the issue waiting. I actually have it, hang on, I have it right here. Yeah, so I have it in my possession, so we'll get to it, and hopefully it won't be that long. But anyway, guys, until then, hope you have a great day, and let me know what you thought of this volume if you read it, or if you're going to go check it out. Um, I highly recommend this series. It's been nothing but fun. Um, there's even more comic stuff coming, and I am super excited for some adaptations I've been seeing popping up uh, for trailers and sneak peeks and stuff like that. So maybe we can even do some coverage on those as well, because uh, they are there's some series in there that I've read the whole thing, and I liked it, and now they're getting a TV show. So so it's kind of wild to me that it's finally happening. But anyway, guys, that's for another topic. So I'll see you guys next time. Peace, addicts.